Hello, I'm Brigantia Blackbird of Blackbird's Brew. Happy Sunday. It's time to talk about Loki again, and this time in the context of him being a teller of unwelcome truths. Now, to examine this, we're going to look a little bit at one of the more infamous Norse myths called the Locusena, in which basically Loki comes to dinner for the purpose of giving the gods a piece of his mind. Now, as per usual, accounts and interpretations vary. There is even disagreement about the validity of the tale in and of itself and whether or not the charges that Loki laid at the doors of the gods are true or false. Now, for a little bit of context, let's keep in mind that the Locusena took place after the binding of Fenrir, after the banishment of Jormand Jormandiger <laughs> to Midgard, and Hel being put in charge of the Underworld. So after having three of your children essentially banished, all of whom you love and care about, is it any surprise that perhaps Loki was just a tad irritated with the gods and maybe, maybe as in with any serious disagreements within a relationship, sometimes the topic that people argue about is just a topic and it's a stand-in for what the root problem really is. So I think it's important to sometimes look at the sequence of myths and think about, okay, where were, what was the current status of everyone's interpersonal relationship at this stage? It's one of the ways we can uh, at least try to get a little bit more insight about what was going on and why. Now, um, it is worth mentioning that the other gods, when the, Loki was telling them what for, uh, they did not defend themselves particularly well. And this makes me wonder if what Loki was saying was actually true and he was putting the mirror up to their souls, and what they saw was not a flattering image. Now, when you are dealing with a group of people, and there is a disconnect between their external image and the internal truth, uh, that kind of hypocrisy can make people snap. Uh, it reminds me of the quote from Albert Hubbard. He said, Many a man's reputation would not know his character if they met on the street. And how true that is. We have all met people who, they appear one way in public, but then you look at who they are in private, and it's not just that, you know, the private is a little bit more intimate and a little bit more personal of that a version of that person. It's that they are sometimes the polar opposite of what you see going on in public. Now, the Lucasena exemplifies how this works, and it also exemplifies you know, the degree of rancor that results when the contradiction is exposed and when someone is just tired of dealing with it. Now, I will grant you, it's uncomfortable to talk about the faults and foibles of the gods, because regardless of what they did or how we happen to feel about it, they are more ancient than we are. They have lived longer. They've experienced more. They've gone through goodness knows how many different cycles of evolution. So it, it does feel a bit presumptuous sometimes to look at these things. But uh, it is still worthwhile doing, and we also need to keep in mind that none of our ancient gods claim to be the embodiment of moral perfection, if there is indeed such a thing. The idea of being perfect in that way, that is an affectation that is applied only to the Abrahamic god. Our gods acknowledge that they are fully capable of good and bad, but the most importantly, they have the capacity to evolve, and their stories actually serve the purpose of inspiring us to carry on with our own personal evolutions. Now, I think it's worth pointing out that it's pretty irritating to be judged and found wanting by people who haven't owned their own shortcomings. And I think this also played a role in just why Loki expressed himself in the way that he did during this particular myth. Uh, the gods, both the Asir and the Vanir, they had a habit of looking down on him. And it, you know, the dynamic is reminding me more and more of a high school scenario. You know, you have this group of the popular kids, and then you have a couple of outliers. <coughs> Sorry, still working on this cough. But these outliers, they're, you know, they're kind of the smart kids. Occasionally, they're useful to the popular kids. But the popular kids never really fully accept them. You know, it's all right if they're helping them get out of a pinch. But apart from that, you know, they're fine for that person to stay over there, out of sight, out of mind. And, you know, just because someone doesn't fit in, it doesn't make them a bad person. And it doesn't make their observations about the people who are in the fitting-in group wrong. 
and rejecting people because they're not going along with whatever the majority says. That's just a silly thing to do. You are actively creating an enemy and a needless enemy. You could have had this person be an ally or at least someone who was a neutral party. But when you don't like someone just because they aren't like you, I mean, you are in a, in a sense, in a sense, you are setting the terms of that relationship and you are creating someone who is going to not be inclined to cooperate with you or think well of you. Something to keep in mind. As is the reality that sooner or later, be it Loki himself or someone with a Lokian spirit, uh, people do get tired of other people's crap. And they just start telling the truth. Consequences be damned and facts don't care about your feelings. And we are starting to see that in our larger society that people just get tired of being told that they're horrible or they're wrong because they're not fitting in with one particular little group. And then they just start talking and like, no, no, I'm done negotiating with you. You're going to look down on me no matter what. Why should I accommodate you? Why should I pretend like I think your side of the argument has any validity? Creates problems. Just saying. We can even see this in real life. Now, the thing about honesty is that it can be a ferocious thing, but at least honesty has the benefit of being real and being truthful. You know, you can tell a lot of pretty lies, but no amount of pretty lies is going to transform into reality. And so many of the people who say that they value honesty, more often than not, that's not what they mean at all. A lot of people, they just want to be told what they want to hear but beyond that, they want the people telling them what they want to hear to be believable. It isn't enough for most people to just lie to themselves. They need other people to actively participate in that lie. And then maybe they can fool themselves into believing that, oh, this is the truth after all. But that's not how it works. And the worst lies we ever tell are the lies we tell to ourselves. And then just coercing other people into supporting that self-deception, it's compounding our initial error makes the consequences of it a lot worse. And refusal to accept what is, it damages the soul. You know, it's like trying to to, re, to uh, rewrite how math works. You know, no matter what we do, 2 plus 2 is always going to equal 4. Not 5, not 3, just 4. Every time. To pretend otherwise is an attempt to fake reality, is a lie. And when we are dishonest, with especially with ourselves, that is an attempt to fake reality, and it's just as foolish as trying to rewrite how math works. And reality isn't going to have it. Sooner or later, it will reassert itself, and the more we try to fool ourselves, the more vengeful and painful that reality is going to be. Self-deception is self-sabotage. It hampers our ability to pursue our goals achieve our dreams or build a life that's actually worth living. It also prevents us from having a sense of integrity where the gods are concerned. How can we learn the lessons that they want to teach us if we can't be honest with ourselves? We are making it impossible. So we have to cultivate personal integrity in order to progress spiritually. Life is not theater, and trying to exist as if it is is a really unhealthy thing to do. So if we constantly present a false image to others and constantly try to convince ourselves that our disguise is actually the real us, it's a recipe for creating emotional problems. I think this is one of the reasons why people in the entertainment inter industry will sometimes lose their mind because the pressure of, for their entire life to be performative. It makes people crazy. You know, the performance, no matter how skillful, it still isn't real. And we need reality in, in order to thrive. And we can see that happening on the macro level with um, a lot of celebrities. But it also happens on the micro levels within ourselves. Now when it comes to uh, shattering illusions, people do tend to get a bit mad about that. Uh, perhaps you have found yourself saying something that's true that the other person didn't want to hear. And then the situation turned into a complete fiasco. But just because someone reacted badly, it doesn't invalidate the truth. But it could be a sign that the person intends to make you suffer for the high crime of not telling them the lies they want to hear. People can get very hateful about it. And when you get to thinking about it, this and other things, I mean, so many of our problems, it really is astonishing how many 
they are self-inflicted, or we are actively making them worse through our voluntary actions. Now, on the flip side, we this state of affairs does mean that it is also within our power to remedy our problems, but uh, try suggesting that to people when they are the author of their own troubles and just see what happens. Uh, there's probably going to be a nasty reaction, but this reaction is a rejection of personal responsibility. It's an attempt to evade the truth and keep the wool over their own eyes. That's why they don't thank you for it when you say that, you know, you have the power to do something. They don't really want that power. They want someone else to fix it for them. And some people will then go to the effort of trying to discredit the truth teller. They'll twist words, spin the facts, and do whatever they can to to super glue together their fractured pseudo reality so they can avoid dealing with the truth. And we have daily proof of this process in every facet of society. People fear reality because they fear the effort required to deal with it. But they don't fear the effort required to ignore it. And that actually is ultimately a lot more work. But they don't want to deal with the reality. And it's very revealing of human nature and of the character of specific individuals. So it's not easy to be a truth teller. In a lot of ways, it would be so much easier to lie. People reward lies. Either they say they don't, but they do. But it's especially if you lie to them convincingly enough. They'll give the impression they like you. They'll give you approval. They'll show you, they'll show you mutual support for a while until reality intrudes again. It can't be ignored. And then they're suddenly wondering why no one was ever honest with them. And then you the person who told them what they wanted to hear are getting blamed because you accommodated their delusions exactly the way they wanted to. But now you're a bad person. They're a victim. Funny how that works. <clears throat> if Loki had flattered the vanity of the gods, he probably could have been much more successful in manipulating and maneuvering them. You could even argue that it would have been a strategic advantage if he had, or if he had gone to the effort to be more tactful when he was making his point, or if he had used humor to get the message across, it might have gone over more smoothly. Now, I think it's possible that he might have tried um, gentler approaches in the past. We don't really know one way or the other. But on the other hand, sometimes it's necessary to call a spade a spade, and that's what Loki chose to do in the Locusena. And, uh, you know, he got uh, the usual reward for telling truths that people don't welcome. And we're living in a society in which people are routinely punished for telling the truth, punished for presenting factual information, punished for acknowledging observable reality. And it isn't always possible to persuade truth haters through tact or through humor. More often than not, there's no way to persuade people at all. It's just necessary to say what has to be said. You know, there's nothing to lose. You're going to be blamed and judged and even hated no matter what. You might as well be brave and tell it like it is. When it comes to bravery, I want to point out this qu a quote from uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, written by Harper Lee, and it is the character Atticus Finch talking. And he said, I wanted you to see what real courage is. And instead of getting the idea that courage is a man with a gun in his hand, it's when you know you're licked before you begin, but you begin anyway and see it through no matter what. And that's what it's like to be, to be brave enough to tell the truth. There is going to be a cost for it. And sometimes we end up even having to make sacrifices for the act of telling the truth and being true to our own convictions. We don't always win the day. That doesn't mean we should live, leave the battle unfought. And it doesn't mean that our actions are in vain only that we don't get instant gratification or immediate vindication. But being honest, particularly when it becomes a pattern in our lives, it's how we grow a spine. And I'm talking about a real spine that's worthy of the name. This spine strengthens us. It forms our character. That in and of itself is worthwhile. It isn't realistic to think that we will grow or change in beneficial ways without suffering inconvenience or pain. Learning lessons inevitably involves discomfort from one form or another. Consider this quote from Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, character of Edward El Elric speaking. He said, there's no such thing as a painless lesson. They just don't exist. 
Sacrifices are necessary. You can't get anything without losing something first. If you can endure that pain and walk away from it, you'll find that you have a heart strong enough to overcome any obstacles. A heart made full metal. It's worth asking ourselves, what kind of materials we're using to forge our hearts? What kind of materials are we using to forge our character? Do we have the capability to be honest with ourselves and with the rest of the world if we are not building up our own hearts? So it's a choice, isn't it? To be brave, to speak the truth, to be honest, to honor reality. If we look at Loki's mythology, it's all about actions, consequences, and then coming back stronger than ever. Life, reality, honesty, these things leave a mark on us, just as it's left a mark on Loki. But learning resilience, even when it's difficult, even when the truth hurts, is ultimately to our benefit. It isn't necessarily fun or amusing to tell the truth, it's, but it is honorable, and it lets things be what they are, instead of having to constantly feed energy into sustaining illusions that will ultimately collapse. Having the courage to tell the truth when it's unpopular is a matter of personal integrity. It's a matter of preserving one's very being. And I want to leave us with one last quote. This is from The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand, and the character Howard Work is saying this. He says, To sell your soul is the easiest thing in the world. That's what everybody does every hour of his life. If I asked you to keep your soul, would you understand why that's so much harder? I think this sums up the true lesson of the Locusena and of our own lives. Our ability to root out self-deception is that hard work and that difficult world of keeping our souls. Loki can teach us how to do the difficult and how to be brave enough even when that honesty hurts or results in consequences that we don't particularly enjoy. So there's a lot there. I'd uh, love to hear your thoughts. Uh, please come visit me at uh, Blackbird's Brew. There will be a link in the description box below to join. And of course, um, like, subscribe, and leave a comment below if you would care to. But for now, see you in another video.